This is Roger chose uh, Roger chose a good film to uh, open our festival. And we are going to have uh, to present a golden thumb to Haskell Wexler. Not yet. This is a cast of Roger's Thumb. Uh, you recognize it because you have an Academy Award at home. So this was made by the same company that made your Academy Award. Now you have a thumb and an Academy Award. Thank you. And we're going to bring Matt Zollerseis, film critic. I'm sorry. You've done so many things, I can't think right now. I'm a little tired. So please welcome Matt Zollerseis. <laughs> it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to be able to do this Q&A with you. Um, I guess the first thing we should talk about is the unusual for the time credit at the end of the film. Uh, it, the additional credit by Haskell Wexler, which is normally an acknowledgement that you came in and filled in a few gaps, but I understand it was much more comprehensive than that. Can you give us a little bit of the backstory on how you came to work on it? Uh, yes. Um, the producer, Bert Schneider, called me in to see some footage that Nestor was shooting. And uh, he said that um, they were going way behind schedule and that um, Nestor had a, uh, an appointment to go with Truffaut. And so I better look at it because they were way behind. And, uh, and so uh, the time came that I had to go up there. And um, There being Alberta? Where, where was it, in Canada, they shot it? Oh, yes, yes, the other thing, um, Nestor, oh, I have to mention that Nestor is an old time friend of mine, and, uh, uh, and Nestor also has, has certain philosophy of, of how to do photography. Uh, sort of pure. He doesn't want, uh, in fact, what he said to me when I came to relieve me, he said, now remember, um, uh, just use uh, what's available, available light. And of course, you know, when you shoot films, um, so I said to him, Nestor, yeah, what's, what's available on the truck? <laughs> See? Um, and also he said, no diffusion. He, and he had an idea that if the camera were just there and, and photograph things as they were, uh, that then it would be more honest. And um, of course, I don't, I don't agree with that philosophy, but I do agree with Nestor. But my assignment was to go up and, and to maintain the, uh, the kind of images which were incredible to see uh, that he, he began. And yet, it, it might be a good point here to bring up the fact that you have a lot of experience as a documentary filmmaker, as, as somebody who photographs life. And, and your, uh, one of your landmark movies, Medium Cool, was equal parts, I think, drama and documentary and to some degree, wasn't it? And, and I, I'm looking at this movie tonight, I was thinking that in a way it almost seems like it is a film that has been created so that a documentary could be made about it. So it seems like you would maybe... <laughs> fit into that? Well, you have to know that the, the imagery is Terry Malick. It, I mean, it's not just Nestor and me. I mean, what you're looking at all the time, T Terry is, um, he, he's a weird guy. <laughs> he, 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 I mean, he, he is, he, he is um, uh, sort of ecologically spiritual. I mean, uh, all the cuts to the animals, and actually even the way the actors are, 
in relation to um, in relation to the scenes. It's not it, to me anyway. It's not like regular actors. It, they're sort of you're looking at them a lot. Well, they're the word. They're also wildlife yeah. in a way. But but the but the main thing that I wanted to say about about Terry is I also want to say about photography, is what's in front of the camera. Uh, is not just what we do through the lens. I mean, the, the, the product, uh, Jack Fisk, for example, the, the, the wardrobe, um, the, uh, actually the, the grips, the electrician, all that are part of what we do. And uh, that's not to make me sound like some generous guy, but actually, um, that's what photography is, and and I and I I don't know how many of you read Roger's review of the film, but how Roger reviewed the film is yes, he like most reviewers, he talked about the actors, he talked about the tech, talked about the photography, he talked about the different aspects of it, but then he talked about the story, Terry's story, and how those elements uh, coalesced, or how Terry actually made them coalesce with the help of the incredible editor, Weber. And but, but I, the reason I wanted to make that point is because that's what I like about what Roger says about films, is he, he, he after he adds all this up, and then he says, well, what is the story? What are they telling us? Yeah. And then he, and how well they tell us. And, that, and he filters that story of, is that the kind of story that fits with what I like or, or, or that moves me or that interests me? Well, that's what made him, I think, so, so great and valuable. And, I, and of course, I don't, I don't think anybody here could help thinking about Roger as this movie was unfolding, not just because he liked this movie so much, but also because I think this movie, in a way, kind of expresses his spirit. There's something extremely generous about this movie and the way that it looks at people. And, uh, and he gets at that, actually, you mentioned his review, I think it might be a good point to read just a little piece of it. Um, Days of Heaven's great photography has also generated a mystery. The credit for cinematography goes to the Cuban Nestor Almendros, who won an Oscar for the film. Days of Heaven established him in America, where he went on to great success. Then there is a small credit at the end, additional photography by Haskell Wexler. Wexler, too, is one of the greatest of all cinematographers. <laughs> Aw, shucks. <laughs> that credit has always rankled him. No, he was my friend. <laughs> <laughs> and he once sent me a letter in which he described sitting in a theater with a stopwatch to prove that more than half the footage was shot by him. <laughs> the reason he didn't get top billing is a story of personal and studio politics, but the fact remains that between them, these two great cinematographers created a film whose look remains unmistakably in the memory. <laughs> well, I don't think he just said that because uh, you shot so much uh, yeah, in Chicago. Yeah, actually, uh, I was, uh, Nestor and I and Bert Schneider, producer, uh, met, and I, after I saw the film and saw how much I shot, I, I showed my uh, regular Hollywood selfishness, and I thought I ought to share the director of photography credit with, with Nestor, and then, then Bert said, uh, well, you know, you already got the Academy Award, and the Academy will only have one, uh, only one credit on a, for a director of photography. So, uh, and then, so then I got generous, <laughs> and I said, yeah, Nestor. And, um, and then afterwards, a little while after, because I was, there was a little dispute. Uh, um, I realized that, that uh, uh, Nestor set the style. He and Terry said everything. Everyone else that I talked about who presented what was in front of it was theirs. So that I think the way the titles are, are correct, really. And uh, I say that, I emphasize that because Nestor's not here for himself and he was a great, good guy and uh, I love him very much. So. Uh, is it possible now, even, you know, it's so many years ago, to look at the movie and say, oh yes, I, sh I did that shot, Nestor did this shot, or does it all sort of blur together for you at a certain point? I have, a, I kick 
Rita a couple times during the screening because I remember a couple of things that I liked. You know? What are some of the things that you should, what's, are there particular sequences or are they individual shots? I'm trying to understand how these, it, se it feels seamless when you're watching it, but obviously it was not. Well, uh, there, there, I mean, there are about, I don't know how many scenes which are totally mine, but a lot of it, and actually what I'm most proud of, were parts of scenes that Nestor shot, which were not completed and not cuttable, because Nestor, one of the things that took so much time is Nestor, we, uh, where we were working in Lethbridge in Canada, there, there's a long mystic hour. That, that's magic time when it's neither night nor day, and the I, light is, is very interesting. And Nestor would actually have uh, the actors rehearse in the bad light, and they would wait hours, and it's one of the reasons they were behind schedule. Um, and, um, they so, can only shoot two or three hours a day that yeah. way. <laughs> oh yeah, the, the reality is. <laughs> um, but that did take time and that's why they got, they were, uh, that way we're way over schedule. Can you talk a little bit about Terrence Malick's working methods? I have heard stories that he goes into a production with a very, very detailed script, and the actors read it and, so, and say, oh my, this is so completely fully fleshed out, I can't wait to do this script, and then they get out there and it's something else entirely. And I, I wonder if A, that's true, and B, what something else entirely would You're mean. About yeah, how does he, how does he work? Not, yeah, not. yeah. Um, um, is there a the, script? For this film, I didn't have any talks with Terry, although I, I knew Terry, in fact, he, he uh, we both had the same agent when he was a writer, and I wrote a, I wrote a, a big long treatment, and, and my agent, Mike Meadowboy, said, I've got this young writer who, who, who should work on your script. So I hired Terry to write this script that took place in Brazil, so on. And, uh, and he came back with a script which was absolutely, it was not my script, I know. <laughs> But, but it was a really good script, but no one ever made it. What was the name of it? Do you remember? Uh, it was called Bernardo. It was about, a, about a, a Brazilian piano player who was involved in a pseudo-kidnapping. <laughs> how, how did you communicate with him on the set? What sort of instructions did he give you, or did he give you instructions? What, did, how did that, what was it like? Terry does not talk much. You know, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, Terry is the opposite of a Hollywood. Even the opposite of Hollywood, Hollywood directors, most they're always pointing, they're talking. Nowadays, of course, they're on a thing like this. But Terry, uh, the actors would come out, for example, or um, there would be just general action. You saw the kind of scenes they were. They were, they were more. They weren't like regular scenes in regular dramatic films, you know? Very elliptical. Look, at, the only thing is, I know that Terry discussed, when, when, it, when he heard that I was gonna come out here talk about Days of Heaven, uh, and Terry gave it a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anything that he doesn't like about me or residue of the stuff with Nestor, I think that's pretty well gone. When was the last time you saw the movie all the way through? Did you watch it tonight? I looked at it, uh, after all, we made it 31 years ago, so I looked at it the night before last. And I, I recommend, I saw the Criterion thing, and in the Criterion thing, there's long stuff with Nestor talking, with me, with John Bailey. Uh, it's a really, uh, uh, a really good analysis of the film, and fits in very much with Roger uh, wrote in his very good review. Let's uh, take a few questions from the audience. I, I was wondering how many of these people ever saw this film before? Well, just wait just a second, because 
Otherwise, it could get awkward. Is there a, do we have a mic? Yeah. We could play cards for a while. That's a... Did you? <laughs> Quick question in the balcony ah. to your left. Right up. Uh, hi. Um, basically, first of all, I'd like to say, like, congratulations on one of the, I think, the best movie of all time. Um, I, I just want to ask, like, quite specifically about the light in this movie. Um, when you were working, as you say, in the magic hour, did, did you intend every shot to come out like it was a 18th century oil piece? Like, how... Like, basically, how, how did, it, did you know it was going to turn out as good as it ended up uh, being? Like, what was the intended effect? When, did, did you see the mysticism on set, or, or did it reveal itself later? Um, when I shoot, uh, I'm not conscious. I mean, I, I do know paintings. I do look at them, but I... Um, I, I respond to what's in front of the camera, knowing it's a period drama. I, I kept very close to uh, Nestor's ideas. Uh, there's very little diffusion in the film, and of course, but there is, there is playing with nature quite a bit. Big bounce, white bounce to go back. Uh, one of the things that uh, Nestor did is, is two people, uh, the sun is coming in, in one direction, two people are talking to each other, okay? Normally, uh, one person would be in, in backlight, the way you, but the other person would not be, and the camera's over here, the, would not be in backlight. The face would be, uh, the face would get full. But uh, since the backgrounds could be undifferentiated, we, both, of, both people could be speaking in, in beautiful backlight. You understand what I mean? Not exactly. Can you well, spell it out for us a little more? <laughs> I want to shoot you where the light is, the lights up the back of your head and so forth. Right. You just bounce a little from like that. So the camera's like that. You look good. Yeah. Okay. Now, the camera wants to shoot me, but the sun's coming from over there and it's hitting me right in the kisser, <laughs> front light. Okay. That may not look good for the mood of this film. So since we don't know what's behind us, we switch places. Oh. I, I sit there, and you sit here. And so, uh, yeah, so the, the cameras. So you always get that nice light. Yeah. yeah. If you don't understand it, you're not missing nothing thing. <laughs> Were some of the close-ups of the actors in the movie added later? Were those always part of the... There were some moments in the film where there were these beautiful, intricate wide shots with a lot of equipment and a lot of people. And, uh, and then suddenly there will be a close-up of an actor and it almost seems like maybe it was shot on a different day. Was there a little cheating going on in the movie? Uh, well, often we had uh, a long lens um, isolating one, cam uh, one actor. What about the wildlife? Did you did did people pick off shots of the wildlife just in between the 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 uh, the buffalo and the birds and all of the wildlife? Uh, well, we had actually uh, I shot some, but we had a, a guy named Ryan, a uh, second unit guy, who was uh, and uh, even when we're shooting major things, sometimes uh, Terry would see a, 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 a turkey or some birds or something and. Shut that, shut that. You know. but, uh, no. You'd just call a halt yeah, to the, the regular the scene. And the second unit did, did a lot, a lot of uh, work. And, and also, uh, the, the editor, you, said, you mentioned how long he took to edit. There was, it, was, it was not somebody that had a script and they just put it in shape. 18 months to edit this, I heard. Yeah. House right, house right. OK. Oh, OK. Uh, Mr. Wexler, um, I have been a fan of your work since Sidney Poitier stepped off the train in, in the heat of the night. And my question is about trains. Um, in your work, there's always this sort of this 
trains look great in your films and you use them in interesting ways and I just wanted to ask you, is that something that you personally, do you like trains or do you just find them very interesting from a, from a photography perspective? I, I, <laughs> that's interesting to me to just say that. Um, in Bound for Glory, for example, from uh, uh, the, uh, I got an Academy Award for, there's a lot of trains. And also, uh, I wanted to be, I, I, I wanted to be a hobo, as a matter of fact. <laughs> yeah, when, and, and really, because- A very well-lit hobo. Where I lived in Chicago, behind where we lived, there were what we used to call bums. I used to go back there, my mom would give me cans of beans to give to them, and I'd hear these stories that they would tell. And then, um, <laughs> when I graduated from high school, um, I ran away with the May Queen. <laughs> And, that, and we rode the rods to California. That's how, that was, I was the first one in the family to move to California, but I did it on a railroad train. If anybody here who has not seen his, his film Medium Cool, please do so immediately, because not only is it as beautiful as this movie in a different way, it, I think there may be some autobiographical aspects to certain parts of it. Um, another question. Right down in front. Hi, um, I know a lot of actors describe their experience with Terrence Malick as frustrating, but I also know that um, Emmanuel Lubezki, his most recent cinematographer, described working with him as life-changing. Um, I was wondering your experience on Days of Heaven with Terrence Malick, what, what was that like? Uh, I can't, I really don't think I, I can, I do, I do know that Terry had an immense appreciation of the images, you know, and but I, I don't, I don't, I'm not conscious enough about t to say anything about that. Fair enough. Uh, next question. From the bal balcony to your right. Okay. How on earth do you ever stage the locust stuff? I don't think you use CG. No. Uh, uh, the locust coming up, we, we had helicopters that dropped coffee beans. And we dropped, they were, they, they were dropped, but we shot it in reverse. And, th and that's how the locusts came up. Analog. Okay, next question. Anybody? Bueller? Turn my mic there, you know. Where are you? Oh. What about dealing with the fire? Oh, wait a minute. Do we have a mic? Yes. Um, I'm bringing it. Up here. Up in the balcony. Up here? Oh, we have a mic in the balcony. We have a mic in the balcony. We're going to take that one first. Hey, uh, um, first of all, you know, the, the, the cinematography and the look of this film is, is, is stunning to me. Um, you know, and especially when you compare it to many of the films of the time, um, j just uh, the, the magic hour lighting, uh, a, a lot of the, the, the backlit uh, against the flames. Um, and, and I know you had a lot of uh, trouble with, with, with uh, the production crew who were kind of used to, to the old, uh, you know, like just brightly light everything uh, style. Um, what, what were some of the, uh, uh, you, you know, techniques that you used in, in order to, uh, you know, really achieve a, such a different look at that time? Um, I think you may have it a little reverse. When I came up, the, produ the production crew was, uh, was happy because, because there was a lot of dead time. Uh, I mean, it could be thought of, waiting for the best light or uh, uh, thinking or shooting some things which are not heavy storytelling. And um, actually, it's not just me saying that now, but in the uh, criterion, different people talking about it, they discuss that. Uh, but basically, what we did, I mean, almost all, 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 all the interiors that I did, uh, that I did, uh, 
because you know if you're shooting in the interior and Nestor says, well, just uh, available light. Well, the light coming in a window in a scene that takes 20 minutes to shoot and so forth, or where the stage not right in that place, uh, you uh, will be, won't be there. And so naturally you take the light outside the window and you simulate it and it'll be there at eight o'clock at night. <laughs> um, so it was that kind of thing. I don't think that I answered your question, but. Uh, I just have to add something for the benefit of any cinematography geeks in the audience. You may or may not be familiar with a camera called the Steadicam, which is this, this uh, stabilized handheld camera that gets these incredibly smooth and sometimes extremely long and elaborate shots. It's the workhorse camera for high-end film production in this country. You see it used everywhere. First use of a Steadicam in a major motion picture was in Bound for Glory, director of photography Haskell Wexler. And, and, and in this film, uh, the little Hollywood scandal is Gottschalk of Panavision uh, stole the Steadicam suspension and put a, a Panaflex on it and set another guy up there. And I called up Garrett Brown. I said, The inventor of the Steadicam, Garrett <laughs> yeah. Brown. And, and so that was, that, that was called the, the, uh, the Panas, uh, Panaflex, I think, yeah. yeah. Anyway. But there are some really good steady cam shots in the film. In this film? Yes. So what are some of them? Uh, when they walk out into the water, you notice the camera goes with them, then it moves all the way around like that. Uh, I can't, I don't remember, but there are a couple other times. Another question? House right. House right. Is that right? House right, sorry. <laughs> yeah, in the locust scene, could you also talk about how difficult it was dealing with fire and filming that whole scene? Uh, it seemed like it would be awfully dangerous and, and difficult to do. It was very dangerous, and, and all the people were just extras, and, um, and it was okay, and, but the wind, the wind changed, and then I think there were quite a few people were not seriously burned, and also, in movies, you don't realize when there's fire, there's incredible heat and, and uh, difficult to breathe and all those things. And um, this was real fire. It was supplemented just a little bit. And you notice they did, uh, uh, special effects did maintain wisps of fire in all scenes. We were able to use the smoke for, but no, it was very dangerous and there, and there were a couple of tough things happening. Were all of the shots in the fire sequence by you, or was it a mix of your stuff and Nestor's? Um, most of the big fire was Nestor's. There was uh, uh, two other fire things um, that the crew was so happy because um, I was able, when you have a fire, if you just use the fire alone as a source of light, it burns, it burns out if you want to see people, so you have to have so if with some simulated fire light, you can, uh, uh, Stanley Kubrick done that, you know, when they light candles and so forth. Yeah. No. no, but the big, the, the, most of the big things was all Nestor. Next question. Over here, also up. Okay. Could you say something about the wheat fields? Were they grown just for this film? The wheat fields, were they, were they grown just for the film or were they pre-existing? Uh, I don't know, I doubt it. <laughs> Next question. Do we have one? All right. Oh, I'm sorry, up there, do we have a? Okay. In the balcony. This is one of my favorite films. Uh, I love the narration. But it strikes me, and it always has made me think, it's essentially a visual film, and uh, the young girl connects it all. And I, I'm really curious, did they take, you know, your film, you know, the shots you took, and then placed in the narration? Because I think it almost works, there's so much silence there, and the, the film is told visually. Could you tell, kind of talk about how they incorporated that wonderful narration with the shots that you took? Yeah. Yes, uh, Roger, uh, you should read Roger's review because uh, at the time uh, I was not aware of it, but Roger's review speaks of 
uh, Linda Mans. Linda Mans as being uh, the main character of the film, and and because of how she looks at the film, is almost looks at the film as not like a narrator who's right there at that time, but who gives another layer to it. Um, I did have one beef with Terry at the time because they're supposed to be from Chicago and she has this heavy New York accent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so does he. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, this is from Roger's review talking about the use of voiceover. Against this backdrop, the story is told in a curious way. We do see key emotional moments between the three adult characters. Bill advises Abby to take the farmer's offer. The farmer and Abby share moments together in which she realizes she is beginning to love him, and Bill and the farmer have their elliptical exchanges in which neither quite states the obvious. But all of their words together, if summed up, do not equal the total of the words in the voiceover spoken so hauntingly by Linda Manns. She was 16 when the film was made, playing younger, with a face that sometimes looks angular and plain, but at other times, especially in a shot where she is illuminated by firelight and surrounded by darkness, has a startling beauty. Her voice tells us everything we need to know about her character, and is so particular and unusual that we almost think it tells us about the actress, too. It is flat, resigned, emotionless, with some kind of quirky Eastern accent. <laughs> She's from the Lower East Side, though. Hers is, hers is for real. I guess they could have just made him from New York and saved themselves some trouble. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, how's left? And this will have to be our last one. Okay. As I was looking at this, I was constantly reminded of Andrew Wyatt. Was that intentional? The paintings of Andrew Wyatt? If you want to compare my photography to any great painter, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> time you see the train and the smoke coming across the prairie, I was thinking, somebody from Hogwarts stole that from you. <laughs> Not only has somebody from Hogwarts stolen that from him, but there's a lot of younger directors, and I love this, actually, because I'm a huge Malick fan, who are stealing from Malick, learning from Malick, telling a story in a Malick-like way. And in fact, not only is there a new Terrence Malick movie in theaters, To the Wonder, uh, this is, you know, if you've seen it, you know that I'm not crazy. Spring Breakers is extremely Malick-like in the way it tells its story. And uh, that director's first film uh, starred Linda Manns and had a very Days of Heaven-like narrator. Um, and that Shane Carruth film, Upstream Color, has some very sort of Malicky moments. I don't know if Malicky is a word or not, but let's pretend it is. Thank you so very much for sharing your Thank you for time and experience with us. Haskell Wexler, ladies and gentlemen.